Now in the liver there's going to be metabolic processing of proteins. A lot of protein metabolism is going on. And in particular we're thinking about proteins are going to be deamianated. They're going to be broken down to be used as energy. So proteins are composed largely of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen and uh, nitrogen. Whereas fats and carbohydrates only contain carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. And this means that when proteins are broken down, nitrogen is left over as a waste product. And this nitrogen is actually produced in the form of ammonia, which is NH3. And of course, ammonia is a very alkaline and a very toxic substance. We don't want too much of that uh, in free form in the body at all. So we have this ammonia in solution as a result of protein metabolism, particularly protein and amino acid deamination. And the ammonia must be rapidly removed from the blood. Very toxic. And as well as that, actually, there's a lot of ammonia produced by the uh, bacteria in the gastrointestinal tract. And as you remember, the gastrointestinal tract drains directly to the liver via the hepatic portal vein. So quite a lot of gastrointestinal derived ammonia is going to arrive in the liver as well. But wherever it comes from, we can't leave it hanging around because it's very toxic. So the ammonia is going to be taken up by the individual liver cells, the hepatocytes, with their nucleus. So the ammonia is going to be taken up by the hepatocytes. Ammonia is going to enter the hepatocytes. And what the hepatocytes do is they transform this ammonia into a much less toxic but highly soluble nitrogen containing substance or waste product, what's going to be a waste product, called urea. So ammonia goes in and urea comes out. What actually happens, the chemistry here is that two uh, ammonia, two NH3s are actually combined with a carbon dioxide. And we have this substance here, which is urea, much less toxic than the ammonia. And the urea, because it's highly soluble, can just go off to the kidneys where it can be excreted in the urine. And not only is it excreted in the urine, it is excreted in the urine, but it also performs a useful function within the kidney, promoting reabsorption of water from some of the renal tubules. So it actually performs a useful function when it's on its way out, but eventually the urea will uh, enter the urine as the waste product of this nitrogen metabolism. Now, if the liver's not working properly, if the individual hepatocytes are not working properly in liver failure, then the waste ammonia and the ammonia derived from the gastrointestinal tract is not going to be removed because the hepatocytes are unable to carry out this function of converting the ammonia to the urea. And as a result of this, we get accumulation of ammonia in the blood. And this is toxic, but the most sensitive organ in the body, the one that's affected first is the brain. And this will cause a condition called uh, hepatic encephalopathy. So the buildup of ammonia will initially lead to hepatic encephalopathy, disease of the brain caused by malfunction of the liver as illustrated by this individual hepatocyte here. And this is why we give uh, lactulose to lower the pH of the gastrointestinal tract to neutralize the ammonia. So the ammonia will still be derived from uh, deamination of amino acids, but the ammonia coming from the gastrointestinal tract will be neutralized if we give lactulose. And uh, I've certainly seen patients with quite severe hepatic encephalopathy who seem to make a miraculous recovery when we give such a thing, simple thing as giving them lactulose, which of course we normally use for constipation. But it neutralizes the ammonia because the ammonia is very alkaline, reducing the amount of ammonia coming from the gut 
via the hepatic portal vein to the liver, therefore reducing the total amount in the body. But this is the normal picture we see with the production of uh, urea, very important physiological function of the liver. So remember, if there's liver failure, it's a buildup of ammonia that can occur. If there's renal failure, it's a buildup of urea that will occur. So uremic patients, uremia is a feature of kidney failure. Ammonia and con consequent uh, hepatic encephalopathy is a feature of the failure of the hepatocyte, a feature of liver failure. Now I think we'll carry on and think about a, a couple of other functions of the liver. There are so many we could, uh, we could choose from. The liver has got hundreds of functions. If you think about the liver again. And now we want to think about the, uh, the storage of nutrients as we've, we've mentioned this before. But it's good to think a little more about the liver and its role in the, the storage of nutrients. Now the liver stores the fat soluble vitamins. Because there is fat stored in the hepatocytes, uh, the fat soluble vitamins are able to dissolve into uh, the fat that's stored in the liver. So the, the liver is able to store these A, D, E and K, the fat soluble vitamins, ADEC. ADEC are the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E and K. And, and these are stored, as we've said, associated with triglycerides in the individual uh, hepatocytes of the liver. And the liver will also store reserves of vitamin uh, B12. Vitamin B12. And, and these reserves can be uh, quite extensive. Sufficient B12 is stored in the liver to prevent deficiency developing probably for, for several years. But of course, it, uh, we can get deficiency of vitamin B12, particularly in well, malnutrition if it's not taken in the diet, but also in the condition of pernicious anemia, where the B12 is not properly absorbed anymore. So even if deficiency does come along, the, the, the B12 is going to last us for some period of time, um, giving us opportunity to find foods containing B12 without suffering from B12 deficiency with the negative effects on the nervous system and uh, blood forming, the, the hemopoietic system that that can have. In particular, a lack of vitamin B12, like lack of folic acid, can lead to a, a megaloblastic uh, anemia with uh, large, immature red blood cells. There's also quite a lot of uh, AD, A, and, A, D, E and K stored in the liver. Um, particularly A can be stored for a long time. Most people probably got about 10 months supply of vitamin A in the liver. And that's why if we eat liver, we get a lot of these, uh, these vitamins, these A, D, E and K vitamins, which of course is good for nutrition in, in many people. But if we get too much of these uh, fat soluble vitamins, the liver is not able to easily excrete them and they can accumulate to toxic levels. So, for example, the Inuit have always known that polar bear liver is poisonous because it contains so many of these uh, fat-soluble vitamins that the polar bears, of course, get from the, the seals and the fish that they eat. And this is bioamplification and concentration of the fat-soluble vitamins in polar bear liver. And the early Arctic explorers also had trouble with uh, hypervitaminosis as well. Um, it's rather unpleasant, but... Um, some of them had to eat their dogs, and, and the dog liver uh, is very high in fat-soluble vitamins, causing a hypervitaminosis uh, in those early explorers. And of course, large amounts of vitamin A we now know can have a, a teratogenic effect. They can affect the fetal development of the, the nervous system, of the fetal nervous system, explaining why we currently recommend that pregnant women don't eat liver because even liver from cows and sheep contains quite high amounts of vitamin A with this possibility of a toxic effect. Other fat soluble vitamins aren't stored quite as much. I mean vitamin D for example there's probably only a few months worth of vitamin D which is why it's good to get exposed to some, uh, some sunshine from time to time as long as we, as long as we don't get burnt of course. Now while we're doing this I think I'll just mention maybe one last function of the liver. It's so quite an important one. Well, they're all important, of course, but 
Let's think about another function of the liver. And the one I want to think about now is, is ketogenesis. The liver will produce uh, ketones. And this happens particularly under the influence of the hormone glucagon released from the alpha cells in the pancreatic islet of Langerhans. Now, in individual liver cells in the hepatocytes, there's lots of individual liver cells. And the individual liver cells have very large amounts of mitochondria, hundreds or maybe a thousand or more per cell, with these mitochondria with their highly enfolded inner membranes. And these are the powerhouses of the cell where internal respiration and energy production goes on. So the liver cells contain many, many uh, mitochondria. They contain lots of mitochondria. Now, if blood sugar levels drop, blood sugar levels drop, that's detected by the alpha cells of the pancreatic islets. And in response to this hypoglycemic stimulus, they will produce glucagon. And glucagon will do various things. So to begin with, for example, glucagon will facilitate gluconeolysis, breaking glycogen down into glucose. But we only store enough glycogen for a few days of starvation. After that, when the glucagon has caused the glycogen to be released into glucose, and we've used that up, we've run out of, we've run out of uh, glycogen then, then we need other processes. And in that case, the glucagon will stimulate ketogenesis when blood sugar levels are low, for example, as occurs in starvation. So when there's metabolic activity in the mitochondria, in the absence of glucose, then ketones will be produced. So ketones are produced when there are low levels of uh, glucose inside the individual hepatocytes. And what the individual hepatocytes will do is they will take in fatty acids and, and some, um, some ketogenic amino acids, but largely fatty acids. And the fatty acids will be converted in the liver and the hepatocytes will produce huge amounts of these uh, ketones. So the vast majority of ketones that occur in the blood in starvation have been produced by the liver cells. And these ketones have been traditionally referred to as ketone bodies. This is just a historical term, ketone bodies. But there's actually three of them. There are actually three chemicals. So there's beta-hydroxybutyrate, that's that one. There's acetoacetate and there's acetone. And of course the acetone is the one which is very volatile and you can smell that on the breath of someone who's ketotic. So that ketotic smell you get is lysed from the acetone. And the beta-hydroxybutyrate and the acetoacetone, these are both uh, acidic. So when there's a lot of ketones, that's often associated with uh, a reduction in pH in the blood, with a, with a relative acidosis. And if the ketoacidosis is severe, then the normal blood buffering systems can be overcome and the pH can actually drop, resulting in a, an actual acidosis, meaning that patient is very sick, of course. And we largely associate this with, with diabetes. So ketosis and the release of ketone bodies will occur in starvation for the simple reason that these are able to be used by the cells of the body to produce energy instead of glucose. So the brain over time, the heart, the skeletal muscles can all use the ketone bodies as their energy substrate as an alternative to glucose. Now, of course, we stress that the brain must have a constant supply of glucose, and that's true. But over time, the brain can adapt to use more ketone bodies and relatively less glucose to supply its energy. But it does take time to facilitate that adaptation, but it, but it does happen. So the ketone bodies are the body's emergency fuel supply. And of course, these can carry on being produced as long as we've got a few proteins left and some fatty acids. And of course, how long they're going to last for depends how many fats are stored in the body. But fats from all over the body can be mobilised, go to the liver cells, undergo this process of ketogenesis while being stimulated by glucagon, 
which stimulates this process, resulting in the production of these ketone bodies, which we can use as uh, energy. But of course, the irony in diabetes is that there's lots of glucose in the blood, but that glucose in diabetes can't get into the individual cells. So in diabetes, the, the uh, glucose is in the blood. Plenty of glucose in the blood, but you need the insulin to transport the glucose into the cells. Without the insulin, the glucose stays outside the cells while the mitochondria are within without glucose, that <laughs> they're within the cell, but they're, they're without glucose. And that's what causes ketogenesis, if there is insulin lack. So the irony is the patient can be actually hyperglycemic, but still ketogenic. Whereas in starvation, what I guess you could say this mechanism is designed for, is the patient will be hypoglycemic, very low on sugar. So the body is making the, the ketones as, as an alternative emergency uh, fuel supply. Quite amazing the way the body is designed to survive and the liver can facilitate that process via ketogenesis.